Tonight, the race against time to save survivors of a powerful earthquake, now trapped under rubble. Rescuers work to reach isolated villages as families watch and wait. We're on the ground in Morocco, breaking down why the next 48 hours are so critical. A Canadian aid worker killed by a Russian missile. He was killed trying to evacuate civilians, trying to help other people. What drew him to leave his home to volunteer on Ukraine's front lines? Canada's challenge to China on the high seas. We are flanked by Chinese warships on the horizon. We're on board the Canadian warship for a secret mission, a CBC News exclusive. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. Rescue crews in Morocco are urgently searching for survivors tonight, trapped in the rubble after a devastating earthquake. <laughs> Amid so much destruction, a small celebration after a successful rescue. But these scenes are few and far between. Already at least 2,100 deaths have been confirmed, a number that is expected to rise, with hundreds more in critical condition. Part of what made this earthquake so devastating, when and where it hit, at a magnitude of 6.8, it struck late at night in the Atlas Mountains, where many buildings quickly collapsed. The epicenter about 70 kilometers from Marrakesh, a major tourist destination that was also shaken. Chris Brown spent the day in one of the hard-hit villages in the mountains and saw those rescue efforts firsthand. The drive out of Marrakesh up into the Atlas Mountains is windy and boulders still litter the highway, but at least now most debris is cleared and a path for rescuers is open. Time is running out though. Moulay Brahim, a town of 5,000 people, is near the epicenter. At least 25 people were killed here in their homes Friday night. Others may still be alive under the bricks and rock. We met Mosin, whose mother was home by herself when the shaking caved in her home. He hopes miraculously, maybe she's alive. She couldn't run away, he said, because she's too old. In the building next to hers, there could be two or three more people buried. Residents said they could hear screams coming from inside the next day. Many of the buildings in Moulay Brahim are simply built of rock stuck together with dried mud. We're perched here on the side of a mountain, so when that earthquake hit, many of them just crumbled. Hardly any homes here now are fit to live in. Rashida told us, we just sleep outside, me and my two kids. We have nowhere else to go. Survivors seemed shell-shocked. Ahmed Bolal carefully took us into his shattered home. It's been in his family for generations. He, along with a brother and a sister who now lives in Moncton, was raised here. I have tears in my eyes. This is where my father grew up. The whole village is like this, he said. There have been rescues here, but the funerals have also begun. With so many smaller villages in these mountains only getting access now, and with the damage possibly far worse than in Moulay Brahim, the worry is the number of dead will climb much higher. <laughs> Morocco's government has started setting up relief centers with tents and food for those who've lost everything and with loved ones missing. The immensity of what's been taken from them is too much to comprehend. And Chris, of course, a huge loss of life, but uh, some of Morocco's cultural history has also been damaged. Yeah, see, and it's going to take some time to know just how extensive that damage is. The Kutubia Mosque here is a thousand years old. It appears to have uh, come through this earthquake okay, but some local media are reporting it may have structural damage. Uh, we know that another mosque here did have some severe damage, as have those very famous red walls around Marrakesh as well. Uh, but there is also resilience, you know, already a lot of that damage, a lot of the fallen brick and mortar, it's already been swept up and businesses are reopening. Ian. Chris Brown reporting tonight from Marrakesh. And Chris will be back later in the program with more on the search. And we'll hear from Canadians of Moroccan descent about the toll this is all taking on them. My husband lost a cousin, so I have to explain this to my kids. The families who are in mourning and those trying to help will break down why this earthquake was so devastating. That's in about 25 minutes. 
A Canadian has been killed by a Russian missile attack on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. He volunteered for aid groups helping rescue those in harm's way. Jamie Strachan now and a man colleagues say was truly selfless. Anthony Ianat went to Ukraine to help, leaving behind his home in the Toronto area. It cost him his life. He was just a joy to be around. Uh, he was always happy. He was always willing to work and do everything he possibly could to help people in need. Always laughing and just uh, an, an incredible, an incredible person. Last year, the 58-year-old handyman, known to friends as Tonko, sold his truck and traveled to the war-ravaged country, driven by the despair he saw on TV. He worked with a variety of NGOs, the latest Road to Relief, an organization providing medical aid and evacuation. In a post, the NGO said he died Saturday in the Donetsk region. A Spanish citizen was also killed. They were driving near the city of Bakhmut when their vehicle was struck by Russian shells. While not naming Ianat, Global Affairs Canada confirmed the death of a Canadian citizen in Ukraine. To know that he died, um, that he was killed trying to evacuate civilians, trying to help other people is an incredible way to, to use you know, your time on this earth. Ianat had been in Ukraine working non-stop for the last 18 months, remembered as someone who would do anything he could to help. He had such, a, such an impact on me. He came out and he was our ambulance driver. And uh, he'd, uh, he'd never driven an ambulance before, but he, uh, he, was, so, he was up for anything. At this point, there's no indication Ianat's vehicle was targeted. The real question on how to respond to this comes down to an assessment as to whether the Russians were deliberately targeting uh, this convoy, these humanitarian workers. Tanko Ianot, a man driven to make life better for others in this brutal conflict, is now another casualty of this war. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Canadian delegation are stuck in India tonight due to a mechanical problem with their plane. They were scheduled to depart this evening after attending the G20 summit, but while they were on their way to the airport, the Canadian Armed Forces discovered an issue that can't be fixed overnight. Trudeau's office says they'll be staying in India until alternative arrangements can be made. The disruption comes after a weekend of negotiation. G20 countries, including Canada, came up with a new declaration to strengthen cooperation. But Trudeau himself says some parts of it are not strong enough. Evan Dyer explains from New Delhi. Canadian government officials acknowledge that Justin Trudeau's relationship with host Narendra Modi is not good. Modi today pushed Trudeau to rein in six separatists in Canada, and Trudeau says he pushed back on Indian interference in Canada. <laughs> Referendums held in Brampton and BC by a Sikh group banned in India have only made things tenser. Some Canadian business leaders would like to see things improve. But I think when it comes to the sovereignty of a country, we should do everything we can to uh, respect that, because otherwise you're going to get what you're going to get, which is a very strong pushback. And, um, you know, you, you, you reap what you sow. We better be careful that others don't get involved in our politics either. But Trudeau said he wouldn't compromise on the right of diaspora Canadians to express themselves. He signed the summit declaration, but conceded the language on Ukraine was weaker than he wanted. If it was just up to me, the leader's declaration would have been much stronger. The G20 is a extremely disparate group, uh, and we worked very hard to get uh, as strong language as we possibly could. It wasn't just the language on Ukraine that was weak, but also on climate change. There was no commitment to end subsidies on oil and gas, and no binding targets on emissions. It's certainly the portion of the uh, communique that actually disappoints me most. Uh, we are a couple months away from the next big uh, COP climate change summit and there is nothing new here. What mattered most for India and Modi was that leaders like Joe Biden show up and that they agree to sign a joint communique. So from his point of view, this summit was a success. The content of the communique, however, will be a disappointment for much of the world but it may be the best that can be expected at a time of war and heightened divisions. Evan Dyer, CBC News, New Delhi. Now to a story you'll only see here on CBC. A Canadian warship sailing through contested waters, a secret mission months in the making, and we have exclusive access on board. HMCS Ottawa, alongside a U.S. destroyer, sailing through the disputed Taiwan Strait, shadowing them three Chinese naval ships had made for an intense 
14-hour crossing. David is aboard HMCS Ottawa tonight. And David, what's the situation now? Ian, as we speak, there is a Chinese destroyer just at the horizon, continuing to shadow the moves of this Canadian ship, a Chinese aircraft carrier further afield, Chinese fighter jets that have been flying over. We're now in the South China Sea, an area that is also disputed by China. But it is not as provocative a crossing as what we saw in the Taiwan Strait. In the darkness, Chinese warships are already in pursuit. Sunrise reveals a naval destroyer armed with torpedoes and missiles, sending its own message to the Canadians. You have entered China's contiguous zone. Now, as we make this crossing, we are flanked by Chinese warships on the horizon. One there, one quite close to us here, and another one just off to the right side of HMCS Ottawa. China claims ownership not just of Taiwan, which it one day may take by force, but also this vast body of water between its mainland and the island. Canada is among many nations which disagree, arguing international law requires the strait be open to all. We're, we're a long way from our own shores. Yes. We're quite close to China's shores. Why is it important for Canada to come across the world to do this? Okay, moving through the Taiwan Strait is to demonstrate a free and open Indo-Pacific. Just look at all the cargo vessels which rely on access, through which billions in trade pass every year. China argues the Taiwan Strait is an internal matter and wants other countries to butt out. Canada says this analyst is among those pushing back. China could need to think uh, twice about doing something as long as, you know, as, as this uh, issue gets more global. It's drawn right now. The crew of HMCS Ottawa spent months secretly preparing for this crossing, not expecting trouble, but ready in case it came. During a similar crossing in June, the Chinese Navy vessel on the left overtook and cut off this U.S. Navy ship. On this weekend's voyage, the U.S. guided missile destroyer sailing in front of the Canadians did suddenly jerk away. Concerned this Chinese fishing vessel had unusual radar systems and may actually be surreptitious military surveillance. The Chinese warships weren't the only ones paralleling the Canadians. On the opposite side, a Taiwanese naval vessel, leaving Canada sandwiched between the two adversaries. Ultimately, the crossing went as planned. The heavily armed vessels steering clear of one another, all sides safe in their maneuvers. David, was this more about sending a signal to China? Absolutely, Ian, and part of a larger geopolitical game. You know, the West versus China, when you look at everything that is happening in that dynamic, this is just where it is playing out in perhaps a more visceral sense. The idea is sending that message that all ships should be able to traverse this area, pushing back against some of China's claims on territory, on waterways. And it is quite likely we are going to see more of this play out at sea. Ian. David Common on HMCS Ottawa on the South China Sea. Here in Canada, the federal government is under growing pressure to do something about affordable housing. Today, the minister responsible said they're considering an effort like the one seen after World War II to build faster. As Rafi Bujikanian explains, that's just one of the options on the table. 20 years ago, Clive Calloway was fighting to keep shorelines safe. So you want natural trees and shrubs on the shore. He's now fighting to keep his home. We're right on the edge. Over the last year, Callaway's variable mortgage rate nearly tripled, an extra $700 a month. A lot for anyone, but he's a retiree with limited savings. The sad part is we've set our home up to age in place. We even have a little area ready for future help to come and live in. We do want to make sure we're doing everything we can to change the financial equation for builders to build more quickly. The federal housing minister is now saying he's eyeing different measures to help with building new homes faster in Canada, including lowering the federal GST portion of affordable housing projects and setting aside federal land to build rental housing. I'm trying to understand right now the best policies we can do to protect those people. 
For months, the opposition has been hammering the federal government on housing prices. It seems to be having an effect. The Conservatives are surging ahead of the Liberals in polls. If you think life is tough for you, you should meet the carpenter I met at a Tim Hortons in the Sioux who lives in a parking lot because he can't afford the rent. Because an economy where the people who build our homes cannot afford to live in them is fundamentally unjust and wrong. Meanwhile, some municipalities are trying to come up with their own solutions. One of the best things that we could do is make sure that we are looking at city-owned lands and selling it when we need to um, to providers. The government says it expects to roll out funding for housing projects much faster in the months ahead, feeling the squeeze both from homeowners and the opposition as politicians are expected to return to the House in just over a week. Rafi Mujikan, CBC News, Ottawa. A message tonight for residents driving back to Yellowknife. Slow down. Fire crews say some drivers are making it dangerous to fight a wildfire outside of the city. 20,000 residents began returning last week. The RCMP says it caught some driving 50 kilometers over the speed limit. Police say it's especially risky given the thick smoke. Among the residents returning are the city's most vulnerable. Julia Wong shows us the challenges of getting people back who are homeless. After more than three weeks in Calgary, Dave Gagno is ready for more familiar sights. I can't wait to go back to Yellowknife. Gagno is one of hundreds of homeless people from Yellowknife who were forced to flee as the wildfire crept closer. Now, with the city reopened, there's the monumental task of tracking people down and organizing flights and rides back home. It is much more challenging because um, in some cases there's individuals who um, may not have uh, a cell phone or a cell phone that's working. Well, we typically serve about 50 meals, lunchtime and supper time here. The local Salvation Army has been cleaning and getting ready to support their return. And they're probably in their own mind wondering, what just happened to me? We're going to make sure that we have staff available to talk with them and more importantly listen to what their concerns are. This local youth shelter helped evacuate 17 young people and a baby to a small northern Alberta community, packing the days with activities. An intentional move so the youth would not be drawn to the streets of bigger cities. Care during the transition back is also top of mind. They really liked you know, having people 24-7 talk about, you know, relationship problems that they may be having or, um, you know, challenges with uh, family dynamics. We're dedicated to try and keep that um, consistency and connection going. Though for this 21-year-old, simply being in his community again is good enough. I'm just happy to be back in general. As for Gagno, his to-do list for when he returns is short and sweet. Say hi to my cousin Fred and my other cousins and my family, my friends. More and more people are returning to a city that is still getting back up and running. And they're also returning to thick smoke, a reminder that Yellowknife remains under an evacuation alert. Julia Wong, CBC News, Yellowknife. A Canadian military leader breaks his silence on an often forgotten battle. Every building in that village was on fire. The smoke, the flames is something I will never forget. An exclusive interview with the Canadian commander years after an operation that changed his life and how he advises the government. A major resignation after a World Cup scandal. I cannot continue my work. And History is made on the court. Our guys showed the Canadian grit um, that was underneath there. We're back into. Firefighters in BC have managed to hold many of the province's wildfires, but officials are warning the public of another disaster that is looming, drought. Lindsay Duncombe shows us how it's threatening communities and wildlife. These sprinklers are part of a strategy to save trees in Vancouver's Stanley Park. Approximately 25% of the trees in Stanley Park are dead or dying at this time. Killed by the Western Hemlock Looper, 
a natural pest that usually causes problems for a year or two. But because the park is so dry, this infestation is in its fourth year of destruction. In the, you know, the, the recorded history of, the, of Stanley Park, as we are aware, uh, there's no record of this amount of mortality. Just one example of the slow-moving emergency that is BC's drought, gripping 80% of the province. Areas in orange or red are likely or certain to be hurt for lack of moisture. It is unlike any kind of drought conditions the province has ever faced and, in my opinion, truly is a, a sleeping giant of a natural disaster that we are challenged with right now. The impacts will be very, very real. There are worries rivers will be too shallow and too warm for spawning salmon. And concerns about tourism too. In Tofino, hotels have removed plugs from bathrooms so guests won't use too much water bathing. This summer in particular, we received about 75% less rain than we would in a typical fairly dry summer. Rain though, if it comes too heavy, too hard, will bring problems of its own in areas that have exposed soil, either due to drought or forest fires, which are basically the result of the drought, we may wind up with increased flooding. There's potential then for a pylon of disasters, all of them linked, adding more anxiety, uncertainty and change to a province that's endured so much already. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. A Canadian commander speaks for the first time about the atrocities he witnessed 30 years ago. We saw neighbours killing neighbours. It, uh, it was very, very sad. The exclusive interview with the military leader changed by a battle few Canadians know about. Canadians received devastating news after that massive earthquake. This is actually uh, the village where the cousin of my husband passed away, unfortunately. We're in Morocco, where time is running out for those still trapped in the rubble. And international students are bearing the brunt of a housing crisis. They're pushing the beam on us. Why limiting visas may not be the answer. If the government announced a cap tomorrow, it would be disastrous. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Spain's embattled soccer president says he's resigning. Luis Rubiales told Piers Morgan he made the decision after consulting with family. They say to me, Luis, now you have to focus in your dignity and to continue your life because uh, if not, probably you are going to damage people you love. Rubiales has been under fire since kissing Spanish player Jenny Hermoso after her team won the World Cup last month. She's maintained the kiss was non-consensual. Canada's top military commander speaking out for the first time about a battle many Canadians have never heard of. He was part of a peacekeeping mission that fought in the Battle of Medak Pocket in the former Yugoslavia. General Wayne Eyre says it left him forever changed. He spoke exclusively with our Murray Brewster. Somber reflection over a battle few Canadians know about. Madak, a village in the former Yugoslavia. The scene in late 1993 of a death struggle involving Croats and Serbs in a gruesome civil war. In between them, Canadian peacekeepers, including a future leader. Canada's current top military commander was a young captain in 1993, leading a reconnaissance platoon in Madak pocket. So this one right here, that's actually my platoon. This is the first time he's spoken publicly about what he saw as Croatian forces tried to drive Serbians out of the region and the atrocities his unit uncovered in the village of Liki Sitluk. Every building in that village was on fire. Uh, the, the, the smoke, the flames is something I will never forget. We discovered a number of bodies. But I tell you, the, uh, the smell, um, the smell is something that it took me years to, uh, uh, to, 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 to move away from. Air says Madak has had a profound impact on the military advice he gives the government today. Canadian troops in that 16-hour firefight with Croatians weren't expecting nor equipped for the worst-case scenario. One of the lessons is that civilization is a very thin veneer that could be readily ripped away. Uh, and in this case, we saw neighbors killing neighbors. It was, uh, it was very, very sad to see. Madak is not as well known as battles such as Vimy Ridge. But historians and soldiers say 
it should be, even though it doesn't fit with Canadians' traditional view of peacekeeping. It was never duly reported in Canada because they just couldn't understand from the government on down why are peacekeepers over there killing people. Croatians have a different view of history. They say they fired in self-defense and never committed atrocities. Evidence collected by Canadians was used in the war crimes prosecution of a Croatian general who was later acquitted. Marie Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Every night at this time, The National takes you to the heart of the biggest news stories. Tonight, the urgent search for survivors after that powerful earthquake. This is The Breakdown. A life-saving rescue underway in Morocco, and so many more to go. Two days after a 6.8 magnitude quake spread death and destruction, the next 48 hours are absolutely crucial to saving lives. The number of dead, already more than 2,000. The big challenge right now is getting to the hardest hit villages and getting there quickly. Chris Brown joins us from Marrakesh to break down these hurdles. But first, Chris, you spent time both in the city and the mountains today. Tell us what you've seen. Well, Ian, what's really striking about coming here in the aftermath of this earthquake is just the difference between the city and the countryside. You know, uh, Marrakesh is a, a modern place. Lots of tourists come here, extremely popular with people from all around the world. And so the buildings are new, and those new buildings look like there's never been an earthquake. There's no cracks in the glass and the businesses are open. Like all of the retail shops, all the hotels, uh, they look fine. But then the more you get out into the countryside where you see things aren't built to withstand earthquakes, that's where you really notice the difference. And certainly up in the mountains, uh, you know, the rocks really and that mud that they're all held together with, uh, it really was never meant and could not ever hold up against an earthquake. Even though here in the city, there are some of those older buildings, they may not have fallen down, but around us tonight in this park where we are, um, it's quite interesting. There's lots of people, at least hundreds of people, who still are worried about the status of their, uh, of their structure, of their house. They're worried it could fall down. And so they're sleeping out here in the park, entire families, uh, sleeping bags um, and, and so forth. So. You know, it's hard to say how long they can sustain that, but for now, um, they've clearly been spooked. And back in the countryside and the pictures of the rubble, and there are people underneath that rubble in, in some places. And so, Chris, over the next few hours and days, time here is critical. It is, and so you have to think that there's priorities that they've attached to trying to get people out when they can. Now, when we were there, uh, we did not see a lot of heavy equipment right in these small villages. And in part, that may be because the roads are, you know, too narrow to get a lot of heavy equipment up. But we do know, and we were told that there are other teams coming in that have sniffer dogs, for example. Uh, and so some of that heavy equipment may be coming. There still are um, villages, a lot of villages higher up in those mountains that they haven't got to. And I think that that's really that's really what the worry is here, is what they're going to find as this uh, search and rescue mission expands from the city, Ian. And, and finally, Chris, what stood out for you today as, as you were talking to residents? You know, it's, it's, it's incredible to think, awful to think that, you know, people, everyone here went to bed one night, they were safe and sound in their homes, and they woke up and, you know, many of them were dead, and the ones who weren't dead had bricks and mortar all, all around them. Uh, and then they have to come to terms with that and process it. And I, I just thought people were so poised that we talked to today. On at least two occasions, people invited us to come and have tea and to sit down and just enjoy like a bit of lunch with them outside of their ruined home. Uh, it, it, was, it was incredible. Um, some really touching moments for sure. All right. Chris, uh, thank you very much for speaking with us. Chris Brown reporting tonight from Marrakesh. Many Moroccan Canadians are being forced to watch this horrific scene unfold from afar. Some now learning they've lost a loved one. Kwabina Oduro now on how families here are coping and mobilizing to help. This is actually uh, the village where uh, the cousin of my husband passed away, unfortunately. The last 48 hours have been tough for Hanan Hashawi. It's a lot of emotions, mixed emotions, because 
Yes, my family is safe, but we also lost, uh, my husband lost a cousin. So I have to explain this to my kids. We have uh, family that are safe, but we also lost someone, like everyone else in Morocco. Hashawi wishes she could go back home and help. We have to be strong. They are strong there. Uh, like, we take the good out of the bad. So uh, we try to help them as much as we can, we, even if we're miles away. We want to go there, but this is very hard. A similar sentiment being felt in Vancouver. I met a, a Moroccan lady yesterday who is uh, both ankle and ankle tight. Grandma is at the hospital. So, so uh, right now we're trying to help those people here. One way to help clean drinking water, humanitarian aid group Global Medic has a team on its way from Canada to Morocco. Without clean drinking water, a lot of people will get sick. The vulnerable, unfortunately, will die. And, you know, we can't have that secondary calamity occur. Morocco draws visitors from all over the world, including Canadians. Right now, more than 4,700 have confirmed they are in the country. 50 have asked for assistance. This Montreal city councillor was there when the earthquake hit. I was really worried and scared when, when it happened. You have to uh, go through... Uh, a, 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 a seven-level uh, earthquake uh, to uh, realize how scary it is. Here in Canada, about 100,000 people are of Moroccan descent. The vast majority live in Quebec. Montreal's Moroccan community holds markets every few months. Normally, a time to share in culture, but now a different tone. I have exposition, but I don't have energy about... Uh, I think, I think, I think about the situation or, all Morocco, it is my family. Even if our family is not affected that much, uh, there's still the country and a lot of people that are dead, uh, that are injured, that are still trapped. As the search continues, so does the work here, with hopes enough money can be raised to help in the days and months ahead. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal. Those same fears over the fate of loved ones run deep tonight in Morocco, along with the open grief felt by mourners forced by sheer numbers to bury their dead more quickly than Muslim custom calls for. That just adds to the shared sense of despair and in some cases anger. Let's take a look at where this disaster struck. The earthquake's epicenter on Friday night was southwest of Marrakesh. The tremors radiating from there, with much of the damage done in remote areas, often high in the Atlas Mountains and hard to reach. So let's find out more about why this quake did so much damage and what can be learned from it. John Cassidy is a seismologist with the federal government. He joins us now from Victoria. Uh, John, we know 6.8 magnitude earthquake, that is powerful. But tell us, what is it about this quake that led to so much destruction and death? Uh, yes, such a such a tragic event there in Morocco. It's it's a combination of, of things. It's uh, first the size of the earthquake, as you mentioned, a 6.8 is very large uh, earth and damaging, of course, earthquake. It was relatively shallow. It was close to some major population centers, uh, something like two to three million people experienced strong shaking during this earthquake. Um, so it's all of those factors and then combined with um, this, this type of construction in the, in the area, the materials that are used and, and the age, very old buildings typically. I don't, I don't think of Morocco as being a place susceptible to big quakes like this, but you're a seismologist. Was this expected? Uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not unexpected. It's, it is a region um, close to a major tectonic plate boundary. So most of the world's earthquakes occur where these giant tectonic plates meet. Uh, in this case, the uh, African plate is moving very slowly to, to the north and to the northwest and colliding, um, that's what produced the Atlas Mountains in, in Morocco. Um, so it's a region that has had earthquakes in the past, but it's been a very long time in this immediate part of, of Morocco. You have to go back to the 1600s uh, to see an earthquake of this magnitude. Uh, there was a smaller earthquake in 1960 in Morocco that caused a lot of damage as well because it was close to, to a city and um, uh, but, but earthquakes do happen here. It's an active plate boundary. We heard from our reporter, Chris Brown, that, that quite understandably survivors are sleeping on the streets, in many cases afraid to return to their homes. Is, is there any way to predict 
uh, the, the frequency and magnitude of aftershocks? Uh, in, in a very general sense, we can, uh, we can estimate what would be expected for aftershocks. And for a shallow earthquake like this, um, uh, a 6.8 earthquake, um, on average, we would expect to see the largest aftershock in the magnitude 5, 5.5 range. So, so far, we, there have been dozens and dozens of aftershocks, felt aftershocks. Uh, the largest uh, to date is a 4.8, so it's quite a bit smaller than, than would be sort of a global average for aftershocks of, of an earthquake like this. So certainly we can expect aftershocks to continue for many days and likely many weeks to come. It's hard to, to say exactly what will happen because every aftershock sequence is different, but certainly these should be expected and, and significant aftershocks can be expected. Yeah, so, I mean, some good reason if you are questioning the structural integrity of, of a home uh, to, to stay outside for now, I guess. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. Um, buildings that have been weakened by the main earthquake, uh, it, much smaller aftershocks can cause uh, more damage mm -hmm. to those buildings. So it, um, that, that's exactly right. John Cassidy, thank you very much for helping us better understand what's uh, going on with this earthquake. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Next, the debate over how to fix the housing crisis. I honestly don't think that a student visa cap is going to produce any, any immediate results. Why stopping the flow of international students may cause other problems. Next. International students say they feel like scapegoats for Canada's housing crunch. International students play a huge role in the economy. Schools depend on them. We don't get enough credit for that. <laughs> now there's talk of capping their numbers. Here's Ellen Morrow to break down the crucial numbers, how much they spend, and their real impact on housing. As an international student, how much are you paying in tuition fees? Um, so I'm paying, like for the first year, I'm paying around 18, uh, 18 and a half K. I pay 20,000. They are like four to five times, they're charging higher on the international students. Universities and colleges get a lot of their money from tuition fees, and international students, they pay the most. I think about 19,000 for a one year program. And I still feel like, oh my God, I'm paying so much. So when the federal government talks about putting a first ever cap on the number of international students to ease the pressure on housing. Certain communities are having uh, difficulties managing with the population growth that it's attracted. We have to address this in a smart way. It includes potentially looking at a cap. That could create a whole other problem. Here's why. Back in the day, universities and colleges received more of their money from governments, a lot more. In 1982, public money covered 83.1% of university funding, but by 2022, government funding was about half that, at 46%. So universities and colleges had to make up that shortfall somehow. One way, international students. The number of them keeps rising, from 351,330 in 2015 to about 900,000 this year. They're pushing the beam on us that, you know, you're coming so well. Like you're the ones who are letting us in. Institutions are a little bit frustrated. Professor Dale McCartney focuses on the policies for international students in Canada. Governments told them, we're not going to give you as much money anymore. You have to find it somewhere else. So they did. And now governments are saying, well, why did, you know, what have you done? And while all students are now paying more, with tuition fees making up 32.5% of university funding compared to 8.6% in 1982, the rates international students pay are going higher faster. Think about this, more than one third of those tuition fees Canadian universities take in come from international students, even though they make up just 17% of post-secondary students in Canada. I, I feel like international students play a huge role in the economy, so we don't get enough credit for that. Consider this, students from India will provide Ontario's colleges with $2 billion in operating revenue this year. That's more than those colleges get from the provincial government. 
International student fees aren't regulated in the same way as other students, and they're also not subsidized by provincial governments. So in 2021, international undergrads paid an average annual tuition of $32,041, five times the average for a domestic undergrad at $6,610. We call that an investment when we go here for study abroad, so we, so we sacrifice that. So if there was a cap, depending on what it looked like, it's not like this money is automatically going to come from somewhere else. And that could mean trouble for a lot of colleges and universities. If the government announced a cap tomorrow, it would be disastrous. It would mean lost jobs. It would mean um, shutting down programs. But if this is about the housing crisis, would a cap help? Some in the know say yes. Uh, last summer, for instance, we saw rents in London, Ontario go up about 20% in eight weeks uh, just because of that supply-demand mismatch. Economist Mike Moffat spoke at the recent Liberal Cabinet retreat where a potential cap first made news. We just need to buy ourselves a little bit of time until we can get this housing mess sorted out and then we can start seeing those numbers grow again. Experts say part of it comes down to building more housing, both on and off campus, and for universities and colleges to think more carefully about whether there is housing for all the students they're admitting. I honestly don't think that a student visa cap is gonna produce any, any immediate results. Luisa Sotomayor is director of the City Institute that focuses on urban planning at York University. It will be really hard to implement. It will be really hard Hard to decide what institutions would have a reduced number of um, uh, visas approved and which ones would not. I think that the fact that the governments are not taking responsibility for whom should supply the student housing uh, is highly problematic. University and college associations have put out statements denouncing the idea of a cap. No wonder international students bring vibrancy to a campus and frankly, the schools need the money. If there is an aggressive cap or limiting on the number of international students, governments are going to have to fill that fiscal gap uh, at the college or university level, or else they're going to find themselves in, in difficult financial situations. And that's something Ottawa is going to have to keep in mind. So the international student program is a very good thing for Canada, but we just need to do it in a more organized way. Ellen, what more do we know about whether there'll be a cap and what it could look like? Well, there's no real details, Ian, but there have been some hints. Sean Fraser, the housing minister, called out certain private colleges in his words that he says are abusing the program. Mark Miller, the immigration minister, echoed that, saying the government has to separate the wheat from the chaff. So could we see a cap that tries to target specific institutions? Perhaps, but it's the provinces that certify which schools are allowed to host international students. Ottawa then grants the visas. So if Ottawa does decide to go this route, Ian, then it will be pretty complicated to sort out. Ellen Morrow reporting from Toronto tonight. Next, a sweet victory for Canada's men's basketball team in our moment. At the U.S. Open, Novak Djokovic put away Daniil Medvedev in straight sets to win his 24th Grand Slam title. At 36 years old, the Serbian is the tournament's oldest male champion. And it was a big day for Canada. Ottawa's Gabby Dabrowski won her first Grand Slam title, partnering with New Zealand's Erin Rutliff to take the championship in women's doubles. It follows Coco Goff's dramatic victory on Saturday. The 19-year-old American came from behind to claim her first Grand Slam title. And this is the other court Canadians dominated today. The men's basketball team took home a historic bronze medal at the FIBA World Cup. After a tough fight, Canada defeated the USA in overtime to take home its first medal in Canadian men's basketball on the world or Olympic stage in nearly a century. And tonight, their victory makes our moment. Barrett down with it, and that is going to do it. This is our first medal at the World Cup. Obviously, a historic moment for us. You're playing the USA. And I mean, you know, 
these guys come at you, man, and, you know, sometimes it's like an avalanche. You know, they hit you, and next thing you know, you're down 20. And uh, and they did it. The pull-up. Got it! Our guys showed the Canadian grit that was underneath. The kick. Barrett for three. R.J. Barrett! And I think that three-pointer by R.J. Barrett in the last minute really was the knockout punch. It as you saw at the end with Dylan Brooks holding the flag up high, right, with pride, saying, oh, here we are, right, we're Canada, we want to be counted too. They had to fight hard, they had to make comebacks. And I'm happy for our guys, you know, they're going to experience this Olympic dream. I mean, when you walk through that stadium as they did many years ago, and there's tens of thousands of people, it's a, something that you'll never forget. Beating the United States, third in the world. I keep sort of switching back between Wondering what's going to happen in the Olympics or just savoring the moment? Maybe just savor the moment. Thank you for being with us. You can watch us anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals' YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannibal. Good night.